So I thought um, it makes, I have one question that I thought I would put, um, raise um, that in some way came to my, I was thinking about it through both of your presentations and I really appreciate your reflecting upon. And um, I think after that it might make sense to open it up because I, I suspect there's lots of questions that everyone has and I'll do my best to make sure that everybody has a chance to ask those. And um, I guess one of the things I was thinking about, and um, I was thinking about it, uh, certainly when Lawrence was first talking about the, um, uh, the right to withhold speech, and it resonated with, um, you know, something I've been hearing a lot about lately in relationship to biometric um, data gathering, and it's the, and, um, it's the invocation of the, the poet and um, writer from Martinique, Edouard Glissant, and his writings around the right to opacity um, as a kind of refusal of certain politics of recognition that we would have um, inherited or someone like Charles Taylor would have written about in terms of an anti-colonial kind of struggle. And, and so I guess what I was thinking about at a certain moment, the politics of recognition are powerfully operative as a mode of resistance on the part of uh, subjects who had yet to enter into, uh, into the mechanisms of, say, of the state as fully, um, fully endowed uh, uh, colonial subjects, with, as fully endowed citizens, if you will. And so the ways in which a certain kind of political momentum was organized around uh, a politics of recognition and then in some way a kind uh, a contemporary um, notion of the political that is figured around a politics of, a, of opacity, a refusal to be captured by the biometric kind of um, apparatus of the state. If, uh, and, and I'm not talking about, it, when I'm talking about this kind of the biometric um, the, the refusal to be captured, of course, we're all probably very familiar with the ways in which there's a certain kind of um, propens uh, the ways in which biometric failure has operated. So the ways in which certain skin color um, isn't picked up by face detection software or smile detection software um, is misreading um, certain kinds of features. Um, and uh, so, with, there's a misrecognition on the part of um, certain biometric technologies which are uh, uh, obviously um, engineered and figured around largely kind of, um, you know, Caucasian sort of subjects as the subjects by which the subjects of biometric kind of interest. I wanted to ask you about this. Um, I guess I'm asking you to sort of reflect on this kind of what I'm seeing perhaps as a, as a kind of shift or a transformation uh, from recognition as uh, that which was uh, produced a kind of very um, operative uh, politics and an insistence on being kind of recognized to the right to actually refuse recognition by the kind of state. If you could both reflect on that, perhaps vis-a-vis -vis the ways in which something like that is um, operating in your own practices and research. Well, should I, do you want to, should I say? <laughs> Um, I was thinking, I mean, the reason why I became interested in taqiyya is exactly because the classic calls for silence don't make any sense anymore, as far as I understand. I don't think it makes sense to now, in the context of mass surveillance, to just say, I want to be silent. I don't want to have to be listened to. I think that's gone. That moment's gone, and we need to think about other ways in which silence can exist forms of, let's say, opacity can exist, or forms of sort of like, uh, it's not even really evading the technology, but finding a way in which the technology itself is also incorporated into uh, the ways we think about, you know, like speaking the truth, for example. So the way that the lie detector, for example, makes this kind of division, mm -hmm. and kind of finding actually that uh, a kind of conceptual, legal, juridical framework which actually collapses the division already, which makes that the object voice and what you're talking about the same thing actually kind of uh, destabilizes the, the, the technology. But it doesn't happen through total withdrawal. 
it happens through another kind of withdrawal as far as I'm understanding in this context. So, in a way, um, I don't really want to be, I don't want to not participate in these kind of systems of surveillance. Um, uh, but I think it's about, of course, and you, you would be also the first to agree with me about using them, remobilizing them in other ways. And that's what I also would do in my practice, where in which it's not always that I'm making these kind of um, uh, performances or essays that have to do with kind of the right to lie, um, but also in other contexts I'm posing very much what I believe, the best of my ability, to be concrete truths, which are, have to do with certain cases, which have to do with certain uh, claims. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it is, for me, about doing the, them at the same time and, and allowing them to actually destabilize each other rather than to make a claim that I should, I should be allowed to be silent or not, right? In this kind of way. I don't know if that makes sense. <coughs> this, the, the effort to erase writing in particular, and, and to some degree to erase conversation, mm -hmm. um, has always been a big part of what biometrics is about. So for a century it's been about saying, this person will lie, and I, once I've captured the biometrics, I don't have to ask them. And, and it is interesting when you go to one of these places where the, the grant payments are paid, there's no conversation, none of this typical bureaucratic supplication, which is the normal thing otherwise. If you confront a state official in South Africa, it involves quite a lot of begging, usually, of some kind, signaling begging, if not mm -hmm. actual begging. And in the biometrics, these people present a card and they put your finger, and no one talks. You know, the cash comes out of the machine and they walk away. And I think one of the problems that we have to get in mind is that I, for, for the vast majority of the Earth's poor, this thing is being presented as a straightforward transaction. You, you will face some, there will be some inconvenience, there will be some brutality, but this will deliver a cash payment into your hands. And people will always opt, this is something Claude Aki said a long time ago, they will always opt for survival over fundamental human rights, if they're offered that, 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 if that's how it's presented. And, and, you know, I think we have to figure out very carefully, we have to think about what it is that we want out of the system. Um, the, the, for me, the question is, the really serious problem is, what are we going to do with the huge numbers of people who have no means to survive on the planet, rather than what do we do with the rights of the people who do have the means to deal with that problem? And I, I, I'm, I'm not sure yet what an argument about privacy will look like in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. I can imagine what it, there are things we could do. You could say, you know, you can't transact in this data. You, if you're a private company and you capture someone's biometric minutia, you've, 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 you know, you've, you've generated a numerical string from a that doesn't belong to the company. It still belongs to the person who gave up the data. And there are limits on what people can do with that. None of that law currently exists in South Africa or anywhere else as far as I know on the continent. So I don't, th I don't think... Um, I think it's worth be being having in mind that this argument about speech, the control of speech uh, being key to this, the establishment of identity is very much, a, uh, it's very much a European and an, an, an English thing. You know, it's, it is key to what it is to define respectability in England, that the state doesn't determine that for you. You get to have a, a negotiation in the process. And the English were not very good at sharing that with the people they colonized, unfortunately, and the consequences have been you know, really a kind of a state that doesn't ask people what they think about who they are as a rule. And that, that's a very widely distributed pattern. It's not just a South African problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yes, I wasn't talking about speech in the context of your presentation, but rather the ways in which, um, you know, say certain kinds of processes that you've, talk, you've, you've already sort of talked about, the ways in which that data that enters into other data mm -hmm. sets and is aggregated mm -hmm. in ways that uh, obvious, oftentimes circumvents, um, say, uh, strictures that might be in place in, ter in terms of, say, not making, uh, not producing credit scores based on, uh, say, particular sure. kinds of racial sure. um, factors. 
So I guess it was about the, the ways in which biometric, their refusal to enter into a biometric kind of database as a, as a kind of political necessity. Um, but as you're saying, uh, rightly so, when, when, you're sur you, when your immediate survival is at stake, it, it, it might be a luxury to be thinking in terms of the kind of like escaping the code, so to speak. Um, but perhaps this would be a, um, a useful time to open it up immediately to some questions. And does, um, <laughs> <laughs> Shout loudly. Or I, I, I could certainly continue. Um, does anyone have a question they would like to ask either Lawrence or Keith or myself for that matter? Um, or a comment or a, a reflection? Oh, are we using a microphone? I guess so. Yes, it's, it's on its way. Thank you. So several years before the Copenhagen uh, climate conference, I was at another COP, another UN climate conference, and I remember being very touched by an event where uh, people from Pacific Islands and uh, people from the Arctic were sharing their experiences. And it was one of the few sessions where most people had tears in these you know, climate negotiations. But then the person from the Arctic, she said, and another thing is the sun is setting in a different place. And instantly all of us, myself included, I apologize, I was trained as a scientist, we concluded that this person was not reliable. And it's so powerful now, my neighbor has found a, a journal article that explains the optical effect of distortion and so on. And I wonder how this biased perception of what the truth is on something as simple as where the sun is, where we should really trust these folks who have been looking at the sun for ages, generations. How does that transfer to the two issues that you have been referring to of who has the authority to say what is, and more importantly, what should be? Because even you're, you're taking the tapes from the trees, in addition to the spectacular beauty that you created in this session, thank you very much, now there's more fruits being eaten by birds uh, <laughs> but also you have revealed something that I think is almost a trespass, right? Now, now I know something about the takia that maybe they didn't want me to know. So who has, I don't know, it's, it's awesome. Thank you, I'm very confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think lying is a slippery game, no? And I think that's exactly what you kind of define. So I think the relation between the sun, I mean, what's amazing about Susan's film is the end where, where the sun itself is actually confirmed to be the liar. And that's its kind of, um, you know, that's, that's the truth claim, if you like, of the, of, the, of the video. So exactly when we speak about lying, we're always going to find these strange relations and these strange contradictions. So I think, um, I think you just, yeah, we need just these kind of interpretations being built between the various things. I don't think there's, there's a point in kind of building one in narrative form, right? Mm -hmm. Between the Inuits and the Druze and the uh, Nigerian Mastercard. Uh, 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 but um, I don't know, uh, one thing I was thinking about, I mean, also you were talking about this kind of colonial legacy, of course, like, uh, in the context of taqiyya, yes, it emerges exactly because of colonial policies, right? Or because of a whole series of borders and occupations that are being made and demands are being made upon people who don't really want to uh, conform to them. And then I was thinking about... Uh, uh, you know, at the very beginning when I was r researching uh, uh, on taqiyya, one of the things that led me to that or the, the places where I was taken to was the context of Rwanda with the uh, sure. Gachacha trials and with the whole argument by the defense uh, in the uh, International Criminal Court uh, who would... would, would uh, uh, hearing the, uh, the case for genocide in Rwanda was that the argument of the defense was that Rwandans have something called Ubgenge and Ubgenge is basically taqiyya and uh, Ubgenge is, uh, means that all the, they will say whatever you want them to say and therefore 
you can't trust any of the testimony of any Rwandan sure. who came into the courtroom. Sure. And that, this was like the ultimate line of the, sure. of the thing. And of course, when you first hear this, it's kind of like, of course, it's just associated with all the racism and all the horrors of colonialism. I mean, the form of argumentation, the way they sure. say it, the way they stand it's in both. court and, to, and may take an oath to even say that all Rwandans are liars, right? So like, the, the two forms of truth production immediately smash against each other because somebody stands puts his hand up and says that he swears to tell the truth and then sits down and says that other people can't tell the truth, right? So on the one hand, it's interesting the ways in which um, these concepts kind of meet the classic realms of truth production, the colonial, uh, let's say, system of truth production. Um, but on the other hand, there is also this kind of, uh, I feel at least, an emancipatory potential in them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I... <clears throat> I, I, what you've described is, I think, probably the standard defense of everybody who's ever been a colonial subject. You say whatever you think is going to get you out of trouble. Yeah. Um, but my position on this question about who speaks is slightly different in that it's partly because I think there are certain people whose voices are just not heard very much. So African officials, I mean, the, the elites, the people who govern the state, they're very underrepresented, actually, in the global debates, mainly because Europeans can't pronounce their names. Now, they can't remember the names, so you've got to write them down. And so I, I and, and whereas anthropologists, and there are lots of them, routinely present the view of people who are, you know, in a village as a, a the little person quite eloquently. So, you know, my view, my feeling is it's, there's quite a lot of traction, usefulness to, to letting these elites speak and to sympathize with them much more than we typically do. They have a lot of skin in the game. You know, they have, that's their lives. Their families live there. They live in these societies, and, and I think understanding what they think is very important and underrepresented. So, you know, you can get the bank, the World Bank's view very easily. You can get, the, you can get expatriate views at the World Bank very easily. What's very hard to get is the, the view of the, you know, the director general in the National Registry Office, somebody whose point of view you never hear. You know, there's always a consultant, someone from some European university that's there who writes the paper up. Um, and and it's, not, I, it's not to me about justice or morality or anything. It's just about what, is, what particular kinds of evidence are underrepresented in the global discussion at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Qu yeah, question right here. <coughs> Thank you. Um, three terrific uh, presentations. Um, I am thinking about uh, the, um, the norm as um, a tool of, um, well, of, of uh, coercion and that the, you know, society's always rewarded those who can most closely uh, conform to the norms that are held up, like, for instance, so the norms of science would not admit uh, something like Inuit observation as uh, valid evidence. And in these other presentations, it, it seems like something comes up in terms of, um, I guess my question is about how well does the technology read um, anything that uh, sort of diverges from a norm. Like, for instance, um, I know someone who who's, has a disease and their speech is uh, changing. And at the same time, they need voice recognition software in order to write. But the software has a harder and harder time um, interpreting what they say, right? And. Um, and so I guess I'm, th I'm, qu I'm questioning, um, does, do these technologies further enforce, do they, do they further um, make the, the norm, um, the, you know, the only terms of being rewarded as e either being considered to have, to have a truth claim or whatever. And the other part of the question is that, you know, elites have always had ways of um, performing the norm. I'm sorry, there's all these internal rhymes in what I'm saying. Um, performing the norm, um, but diverging from it 
in their private lives or their economic lives or whatever. Um, and I'm wondering if there have been ways that um, um, more powerful people find to get around some of these detection technologies. Does that make sense? Um, so, well, it's a little bit like how I began, you know, like um, there was a moment five years ago even, uh, before, just before Siri actually started, where voice recognition was still kind of really bad. It wasn't really bad actually, it was really, it was kind of amazing because it didn't have the same, so when we say bad we mean it doesn't have this same type, same mode of comprehension that we have, right? And actually that was, some, that was kind of amazing. So I remember I was making one installation with voice recognition and uh, what was amazing was that, and this was 2012, that thick Korean accents uh, speaking in English got it right, got the machine to do what it wanted every time. And uh, really uh, just you know, Australian accents, native English speaking Australian accent, you just didn't hear it. <laughs> you just couldn't hear whatsoever this voice. You really just couldn't hear one word from it. Just always ignored this person. Completely. Delighted to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and so, so, yeah, so what you're saying is these, this is what I'm saying is like more and more these things are starting to become boring because it starts to hear like we hear. They start to hear these voices in a very particular way. They start, the programming becomes more efficient. It was really like, I, I think it's kind of post Siri because also, you know, it's like the iPhone and it gathered a very particular sort of class of people who, uh, you know, are voices and made a database and used that as a kind of way to uh, produce comprehension. So, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking about when you were speaking. Now I uh, went some, now I forgot the second thing that you said. Um, well, well, I, oh, sorry. No, oh, I was just going to oh. say oh, about, I would yeah. be perhaps more inclined today to think about, not norms, but think about the, way, the anomalous versus the pattern. So what we're actually looking at is the ways in which anomalies are actually uh, emerge out of um, like data aggregation. So yes, there's a kind of, I, 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 uh, like patterns are constituted around certain um, understandings of, I, I agree, of kind of normative behavior. So, um, you know, di algorithms that track, say, movement of people in large urban spaces. So when, when the trajectory of movement is faster, that's an anomalous, um, event that could suggest say theft from a shopping mall or something like that but what we're really what we're really looking at is a kind of uh, anomalies from um, a, a aggregation of data that is actually uh, producing in some way norms on like dynamically as part of the sort of system so there's not the sort of um, sense of the norm as constant in terms of the mean average norm that we might have had in the sort of the sort of, as a legacy of the I would say of the 19th sort of century understandings of kind of classificatory uh, principles <clears throat> the thing I'll let you come in now in a second Lars. the thing <laughs> that I think people sort of mistake about biometrics is they all think of one-to-many matching as the as the fundamental thing that biometrics is doing so that one-to-many matches you take your fingerprints, you arrive at the airport, and they check you against the database the FBI have 100 million people. That hardly ever happens. I mean, most of the time, it's tuned in some ways to limit the population, or often just you. You know, you're often the only data that's actually being checked on the card. And, and that is much easier to get right. And the, guy, the people who design these things are obsessed with error. That's what their science is. Biometrics is this actually the science of error. So hum, hum, you know, the hum, humanists come to this and they're like, oh, well, biometrics for making mistakes. Like, come on, guys. These guys know that. Yeah. That's their job. You know? They've spent their whole lives trying to figure out ways. The textbooks are 50% error. And then the techniques that you can have for managing that stuff. And so 
and, I, and my response mainly to this is that people need to take seriously how productive these technologies they actually are. Mm -hmm. You know how effectively they can be made to work. Not that they they're not it's not Gattaca. This isn't, a, but it does do some very very powerful things that bureaucracies have had real trouble managing for the last 150 years. So, my point is yeah. very related. Yeah, it's uh, and it connects to Claire's point about the powerful. And exactly that, the lie detector is totally bogus. I mean, it's used everywhere, but it's completely bogus. It doesn't do anything. It's just like, even what they found when they looked into it was that the kind of microscopic nature of this lie detector is so much so that it hears in between the frame rate of the audio file. So actually it just hears like acoustic <laughs> silence some mm -hmm. of the time. So its verdicts are sometimes based on acoustic silence, on digital silence, just, just or noise. So it's exactly that which, and of course they know that. I mean, it's only like these stupid people in like Ilford Council or whoever buy yeah. this thing. But <laughs> no, uh, the point is that it does, even the Ilford Council know that it doesn't work. I mean, everybody from the beginning to the end knows it doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, and, and there's of course a reason why lie detectors have this history of kind of this, also this weird legal history of never being allowed into the courtroom, of being kind of supposedly an interrogation tactic rather than a, anything else. Because of course we always knew from the beginning that lie detectors are the ultimate bogus um, technologies. But it's the bogusness that I mean, this is fingerprinting yeah. too, the same, yeah. exactly the same thing. There's this huge tension between the, the immensely difficult probability, the science, which is really nothing is certain and you've always got an error, a significant error in every single image you're ever looking at. And the guys who stand up in court, I mean, and then say, you know, this is it, 100% yeah. certain he killed her. So, you know, mm -hmm. but the, the problem really is that for people with weak states, these tools function properly. And if you're sitting in a, you know, you're, you're in, in, in a country where the state doesn't have any records for you otherwise, that the remedy of being able to attach your identity to the, to the device is very compelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting because this morning we kicked off the um, day of the curriculum. Bernd was talking about one of modernity's sort of uh, 20, uh, yeah, what, uh, fantasies was that it could somehow stabilize the object, as, as I recall, like fix the object and that this, we're, um, we're living in a time where it's much more kind of process-based, performative, but it strikes me uh, in, in, in some way in both presentations that there's, despite this sort of knowledge of the inherent fallibility of uh, the technology, that there's once again a kind of return to a kind of conviction in the ability to stabilize the mm. computational object. Mm. Um, so that sort of modern obsession with the object returns, but in a, in a kind of different mm. manner in the, uh, in the time of the algorithm, perhaps. And you actually use the words, the objective quality of the voice, the voice. The object quality. The object quality, no, yeah, the object quality of the voice. Like the voice mm. is constituted as an object that can be, you know, calculated, measured, evaluated, et cetera, and then uh, plugged into a data set. Or, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we have, I think we have to wrap up, but if there, is there one last question over there? And, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this question is actually for Susan. Uh, I was interested because I had read previously that um, for some years NASA has been showing through studies that the axis of the Earth has been shifting due to global warming, and this was known before COP15. Uh, was that a conceptual decision or that problematic why that information you didn't include in the film? Uh, actually, that's a good point. Uh, no, I didn't. Um you know, I never even thought of that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> that's, a, that's the sort of simple answer, because there's, there's all, you know, there's often times, like, we know that there, with, um, I think with the, was it the tsunami in the Bay of Bengal, that there was another kind of recalibration of, uh, um, 
of the, the uh, I think it was the, was it the axis or we lost a nanosecond of time, etc. So, no, I, I kept the story um, a little bit more, a little uh, more simply, in, but basically the shorter answer is no, I never even thought about that and that, that's a good point actually. Uh, maybe I, if I ever do another re-edit, that would be worth uh, including. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, one final question, and then we really have to go to break because we have another panel to get to. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I just want to go back to something that we've started with our seminar today in the axiomatic earth. Um, Matteo was talking about like how through uh, metadata, like these systems of surveillance and the relationship between statistics and the state, it's not about what is being done, like what the citizen is doing, uh, what, what the citizen is saying, but instead on what is being done. So in a way, then like one of the questions that I was thinking of is the abolition of language, and which I will return to. So in in the in the audio essay of uh, Lawrence, he's in a way like you're, Lawrence, you're as if in a way positing language, which is this, uh, the classical um, medium of like juridical uh, attestation as a false witness, potentially as a false witness. But then what we look now, if we think also about um, what's happening in, in relationship to uh, surveillance is that um, it's, uh, in a way, language is as if losing its power because there is another mode of uh, more like production of semantics that's as if like paralinguistic because through the meta metadata, which in a way like surveys you and like traces your location or traces your actions, which in a way like uh, destroys the power of language and the, con the content shifts into like these types of mapping that are happening within uh, uh, invisible code. But then also if we look at like the predominant uh, discourses happening today within like uh, um, the privacy of information and also security, it's still like the content is that which being encrypted, which rendered as if like there's some sort of pri private language that is happening between two parties, you know, like an isolated language. So this is, this is like the goal of encryption. But so at the same time, there is this we were thinking about the potentialities of like encrypting the metadata. But then if you think about the lang what is language within cryptography, it's a language that is um, uh, illegible, you cannot read it, but it's also inaudible because it's not made to be heard. And so there's a lot of potential within that. Uh, and again, from this, I go to somewhere else, which, um, um, sorry, can actually, I, is it okay for, uh, I, I know it's very rude of me to interrupt you, but we're totally o over time and there's more presenters technically in five minutes, but we need a little bit of a break, but can we, I think that's a kind of wonderful sort of summary and set of observations mm -hmm. and I, maybe we can hold that as our kind of final comment on the, the panel, so th thank you very much and I'd like to thank Lawrence and, and Keith as well for their presentations. Please join me in thanking everyone, including yourself. Thank you.